Real Virginia is produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Become a Farm Bureau member today. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Just in time for fall, we'll explore the bountiful pumpkin crop in Virginia. Plus, Andy Hankins tells us how to grow butternut squash for seeds next year. And Kendra Bailey Morris uses winter squash to make a delicious risotto in the heart of the home. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're here in Spotsylvania County at the Miller Farms where they grow acres and acres of pumpkins to sell at their family farm stand. But that's not the only way that folks are growing pumpkins and selling them in Virginia. As Norm Hyde reports, many folks are selling pumpkins and gourds to the wholesale market. It's not the state's top farm commodity, but pumpkins are big business to some Virginia farmers. The Census of Agriculture reports Carroll County ranks 21st in the nation for pumpkin production. Five years ago, Carroll County pumpkin growers were already producing more than half a million dollars worth of pumpkins a year. And the Southwest Virginia Farmers Market makes it possible for local farmers to ship their products all over the East Coast, opening up some real opportunities. We started at a little half acre patch and worked up to a couple acres, four acres, and gradually worked our way up. Uh, we're up to about 92 acres right now, and I'd say that's probably got us maxed out for the most part for what we got to work with. We're, I don't think we can do any more and take as good a care of them as we need to. Travis Marshall raises pumpkins, wheat, and sweet corn on his mountain fields. He's been amazed at how fast the pumpkin business has grown and how fortunate growers in southwest Virginia are to have a good climate for this crop. You take a 30 mile radius around where we're standing, there's uh, 2,500 acres, possibly 3,000 acres growed. It's, it keeps expanding every year. Uh, I don't know if it's going to continue to do that. Every year you expect a slump in it, and I think we could sell, easily sell twice what we've got planted with no problem. Marshall's pumpkins are sold to major chain stores and to Food City, a local grocery chain that makes a point of buying local food and produce. He rotates his crops each year to prevent diseases and keep weeds down. It ain't too bad the planting and uh, the spraying, but when it's time to get it up, it's <laughs> kind of like no mercy and got to make hay when the sun shines. So we pick pumpkins as hard as we can from pretty much daylight to dark on the pretty days. In addition to decorative pumpkins, Marshall grows thousands of winter squash, including butternut, carnival, and acorn squash. His whole family is involved, and it's a lifestyle he's glad to pass on to his four daughters. I think a lot of it to work as a family. I think it, it grows good character in the children, and it, it did me uh, hard work ethics that I received from growing up. Uh, makes you appreciate things. Marshall says it's not unusual to ship 40 to 50 bins of decorative pumpkins from each of his fields, in addition to the other squash. And he's not alone. Carroll County has as many as 10 pumpkin growers with fields as small as a few acres to up to almost 200 acres. And there are more growers in surrounding counties. It's become a big business, and Marshall says it's a blessing because otherwise he wouldn't be able to make a profit on his farm. And you know, he's good money in it for, for the, you know, you can just use a few acres here and a few acres there, and you, you don't have to have such a large amount of, of money to, to start your business. So really all you got to come up with is uh, some labor and a market. Uh, it, it just fits in real well with most everybody's operation. As long as folks are willing to pay a few extra dollars for a pretty pumpkin each fall, it looks like Virginia pumpkin growers have a thriving market. Pumpkins are certainly not the only crop raised in Carroll County, also known as the salad bowl of Southwest Virginia. Vegetables and fruit are also top crops and are distributed all along the East Coast thanks to the Southwest Virginia Farmers Market. The principal field crop is hay with more than 55,000 tons produced each year to support beef and dairy cattle in the county, along with 500 head of sheep. Nursery products are another moneymaker for growers, and there are even more than 2,000 hogs in the county. Altogether, farmers contribute almost $35 million to the economy of Carroll County, Virginia. For years, folks have used whatever they could find from in the garden to decorate for fall. And that's no exception for the Viettes. Today, Mark Viette shows us how to decorate our homes with gourds in the garden. <music>
Wouldn't you like to have a dried gourd like this that normally weighs 35 pounds, uh, very heavy? You can have this right in your home and use them from year to year. And really all you need to do is take certain types of gourds, especially within the group that is known as the bottle gourd family, Lagenaria. This is known as the speckled swan and it looks just like a swan. Well, it's very heavy, but you can dry it. To dry gourds, you really need about um, anywhere from 55 to 65 degree temperatures, not too warm because if they get too warm, they'll start to mold on the outer skin. Put them in a cool basement, a cool garage that won't uh, get too cold, and six months to a year later, you can have one of these gourds just like this. You might ask yourself, where am I going to find these gourds? Well, you can buy them. I've even seen them now at craft shops. Or you can grow them yourself, or you can just go to your garden store late in the season and buy some of these bottle gourds. And once they're dried, there's lots of things that you can do with them. This is a great kids project for school, family project, or just, you know, you can do it yourself in the evening or on weekends. And you want to clean them, with the scouring pad, you can use sandpaper to get more of the discoloration off, but it's got a really attractive pattern the way it is. And then once that's done, you know, you can either uh, stain them, you can use a little bit of stain, or you can just coat them with a polyurethane finish. Either way, um, you can use them. But beyond that, you have other things that you can do. You can make birdhouses. When you're creating your own birdhouses, you can use anywhere from a one and one half inch drill bit or even a one and one quarter inch wood bit. Really depends on the type of birds that you want to attract because they, the, the size really determines the type of bird. I sometimes like to use one and a quarter inch sizes because it keeps out some of the bigger birds like starlings and one and a quarter inches is great for bluebirds. The other thing that you need to do is drill holes in the bottom, but what you can do is drill more holes throughout this gourd or larger holes that you can use something like this for and create a bird feeder out of it. So you can fill it with bird seed and your birds will go in it and feed on the seed and you just hang this just like this from a tree. One of my favorites is this one here and uh, this is not one I did myself but it's been hand painted and it's a great birdhouse with the seeds and everything else. So you can even do something as elaborate like this. Or you can even take one of the flat bottle gourds and you can create your own piggy bank. So, you know, this is great with the leather ears and the cork for the snout. And um, even use a stem for the tail. And you are set to go. It's just that easy. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Up next on Real Virginia, Kendra Bailey Morris takes winter squash and makes a hearty risotto in the heart of the home. The farm has been in the family for 134 years. This has been my home. It's the only thing I've known. Growing up on a dairy farm was great. You've got all the opportunities to have fun in the wide open spaces and enjoy working with the crops and the cattle. It's a great way of life for your children. I love working with animals. I believe that the family farm is important in this country, no matter if it's 50 cows or 5,000 cows. A lot of the family farms consume their own products and they realize the importance of having a good, healthy product. I am proud that our family and all of us here at this farm at Walka can be involved in producing nutritious milk for the society. I'm Dan Myers, a fifth generation dairy farmer from Virginia. I am dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and my lamb. A perfect recipe for cool fall nights. Kendra Bailey Morris shares with us her butternut squash and Italian sausage risotto recipe in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Kendra Bailey Morris for Heart of the Home, and we're here in Sir Latab's beautiful kitchen 
And today I'm going to be making a risotto, but it's a risotto that's going to contain a really special ingredient, and that is Virginia butternut squash. And we're also going to add some sausage to it, um, and it's going to be cooked in a chicken broth, and it's absolutely delicious and easy to do. So what I'm going to start with is just the very first part of this recipe, which is tossing your butternut squash in a pan with about two tablespoons of uh, butter, and I put a little olive oil in here as well. And I've already par-cooked this just a little bit for brevity's sake. So we're not going to cook it very long, but if you're cooking it at home and it's raw squash, you're going to want to do it about 10 to 15 minutes. The next thing we're going to add is some spicy Italian sausage. And I've already par-cooked this as well, just for brevity's sake. And again, it doesn't matter. I'm tossing a couple little extra pieces of butternut squash in there. It's not a problem. This is all going to go back into the risotto together, the butternut squash and the sausage. OK. Now, what's important to remember when you're making risotto is to do all this ahead of time. Don't skip these steps. Now, I'm going to add a little bit more olive oil to my pan. And I'm going to, um, technically right now, you'd be sauteing some onions. But I've already sauteed them a little bit. Again, so we can keep on moving here. But this is the color that you're looking for with your onions. It's a translucent, um, almost clear-like color. And you can really start to smell the sweetness of it. It's really, really nice. I've mixed a little sage in it as well. You can mix rosemary or any other herb. Just don't put a delicate herb in there like uh, basil or anything that will fall apart. You, we've got about another 20 minutes of cooking time to go once I put the rice in, which I'm going to do now. I've got two cups of aborio rice. And aborio rice is an Italian-style rice um, that's very, very starchy. And it's kind of a, sh it's a short grain rice. So I'm going to saute this around. And once you start risotto, what you're looking for is a toasting of the rice. So right now, I'm getting a little bit of toasting going. I'm going to turn my pan up just a hair. And when you can hear the rice popping and sizzling, you want to do that for about one or two minutes. That's what you want. That's what you're looking for. Once it gets to that point, you can crank your heat up a little bit, as I just did. And I'm going to add in a half cup of dry white wine. And that really is just to deglaze the pan, get all the yummy goodies off the bottom from when we were cooking the sausage and when we were cooking the butternut squash. And here's the part that takes the time, but it's oh so worth it. It's when you begin to ladle, little by little, some chicken stock. And I like to use low-sodium chicken stock. And I'm just going to ladle in about two cups here. And you can see it's already starting to simmer. And a lot of people are afraid to make risotto. They're like, oh, I can never do this. It's not going to turn out right. It's not that hard. The important thing to remember is you have to attend it. Just keep attending it. And what you're going to do as I start was about two cups of chicken stock. And I add it in slowly. And I'm stirring it around. And I'm keeping it moving. And as it starts, as you can see, to evaporate little by little, that's when you know you need to go ahead and add another cup in. And we're going to do this repetitively for about 15, 20 minutes. If you're at home and you've got your family, you can pass it off to a family member and get them to help you out a little bit. But what's important is you want to make sure that your rice is nice and tender, not soft. It's not supposed to be mushy. It's supposed to be al dente, like pasta. So I'm going to do this for about another 15, 20 minutes, and uh, we'll pick it up from there. And as you can see, it's really starting to come together. The starches are showing really nicely, and that gives it its creamy appearance. And add just a little bit more. Now we can finally go on to the next step, which is adding this uh, butternut squash right back in, already cooked, and then our sausage. And I'm going to stir this around. And you're really on the final stretch here when you get to this. So you want to have your bowls ready. I'm going to give this a little bit of black pepper. And now that we're at the final stretch, I'm going to turn my heat down. And this is looking pretty much done. If you find that your liquid is absorbing um, faster than you would like it to, you can just add a tiny bit more. And I'm going to do that because I'm going to add some cheese, and that's going to thicken it up. All right, I am taking this off the heat. 
I'm going to stir in about a half a cup of Parmesan cheese. If you're a Parmesan cheese junkie, which I am, you can add a little bit more. It's about three quarters cup. And that's really going to make it nice and cheesy and give it a lovely creamy texture. And now to plate it, very simple, just spoon it into a bowl. And this is definitely a, a self-contained meal. You serve this with a salad and some bread, just like you would pasta. You really don't need a whole lot more than that. And I've got a tiny garnish here of some fresh sage from my garden. You gotta have that. And here you have it. Butternut squash risotto with spicy sausage, easy to make. I'm Kendra Bailey Morris for Heart of the Home. Let's get cooking. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafarmbureau.org. The Virginia Farm Bureau Federation will give Virginians the opportunity to visit six different farms during the Real Virginia Virtual Farm Tour. On October 3rd, Farm Bureau will host an hour-long event featuring video footage of six Virginia farms. The presentation will be hosted live at the State Fair of Virginia's Meadow Pavilion from 7 to 8 p.m. and will be broadcast online at vafarmbureau.org. Watch online and submit your questions to realvirginiavafb.com. I think the next generation has to look to be more efficient, be careful, be conservative, but be aggressive too. To be a third generation dairy farm means a lot. It means that I'm able to keep on the tradition set forth by my parents and, and my, my grandfathers. After I graduated high school, I attended Virginia Tech. I studied dairy science. Upon graduation, I returned home to the farm and was full-time, have been full-time ever since. Family farms are very important to society in general. It uh, helps uh, allow the consumer to know where the food came from and it's, it, that it was produced properly and taken care of and able to take it to their dinner plate in a healthy manner. I'm confident the consumer is getting a good product when it leaves here. All dairy farmers, that is their goal. I'm Boris Knuckles, a dairy farmer from Virginia, and I'm dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and my land. Using apples following the harvest to make apple butter is an art that's been around since colonial America. In Troutville, Virginia, Ann Damari's apple butter has been made the same way since her parents made it, and now her delicious recipe can be enjoyed all across the state. The art of making apple butter has deep roots in American history. The term butter refers to the thick and soft consistency of this bread, not to any dairy products. It's typically seasoned with cinnamon and allspice, and this sweet concoction is one that many Virginians have passed down from generation to generation. They started off with applesauce, and it won't keep, but if you cook applesauce for hours and hours, it will turn dark brown, and, if, and then add in the sugar, it's preservative. The Pennsylvania Dutch brought it over possibly, and then into Virginia, the Appalachia, uh, the mountaineers, the mountain folks, grasped onto the making of the apple butter, 1700s, 1800s. The tradition for Anne's family has turned into quite a small business. Her mother and father started making apple butter for sale in 1977. 20 years later, Anne took over the family business and named her product Anne's Apple Butter. The copper kettle I'm using today is the one my father had years ago, way back. And I'm using the same equipment that he engineered. He engineered an automatic stirrer that we can make the apple butter a lot simpler. The traditional method of making apple butter requires apples to be cored and peeled and then made into applesauce. The applesauce will then cook over an open flame in a copper kettle with a wooden paddle, consistently stirring the mixture for close to 10 hours until it becomes a rich brown color. The entire process is very labor intensive. Damari slow cooks her apples also, just with the aid of an automated paddle and peeler. She adds her mother's secret spices and sugar until the recipe is perfect and then hand pours each jar to preserve the treat. And I use local apple from Virginia. The best apple butter you can make are the best Virginia apples you can find. <laughs> so I always say, it's the best Virginia apples. And you can use wine sap, you can use Macintosh, you can use Granny Smith, yellow delicious mixture, a mixture of Rome and those, you can mix it. What began as a few neighbors enjoying her mother's apple butter recipe has blossomed into a nationwide enjoyment of this Virginia finest product. 
and makes her home style apple butter from September to February three to six times per week to fill her orders. She says it's humbling to know that her mother's recipe is reaching far beyond the Virginia borders. I have this gentleman from Washington State. He called me, he says, I've got to have some more of your apple butter. He says, yes, we grow a lot of apples out here in Washington, but nobody makes apple butter like you do. Growing butternut squash in your garden can be very easy and it's a great plant to use for seeds for next year's garden, as Andy Hankins shows us from the ground up. Today we're at Twin Oaks Community in Louisa County looking at butternut squash. Twin Oaks Community is a uh, They've been in seed production, organic seed production of crops like squash for some years, and one of their primary producers of the uh, organic seeds and of uh, winter squash here is Edmund Frost. Edmund, when did you plant these crops? Uh, this was planted in mid-May. Uh, what are some of the things you have to think about in soil fertility and in management of the crop? Well, a lot of work goes into weed control. Um, we have an old cultivating tractor that we use to control weeds and we also do a fair amount of hoeing. What I like about this crop is that you harvest it once and it keeps all winter. So you're not having to do multiple harvests. So the difference between, tell us the difference between winter squash and summer squash. Winter squash um, is typically uh, has sort of a, feels hard on the outside um, and you harvest it in the fall and it's called winter squash because you can eat it all winter it keeps all winter what are the main varieties of winter squash that should be that people can grow um well there's butternut this is butternut squash um, butternut is um, probably the best keeper and it has a really good sweet flavor um, it's probably my favorite acorn squash is good um, buttercup squash has a really good flavor uh, not quite as good a keeper a little bit harder to grow well, Edmund, if it was a home gardener that wants to save seed from the vegetables growing in their garden, what would be involved in seed saving? So a lot of kinds of seed saving is, can be pretty easy. Um, these are some butternut squash seeds that we've saved. To save seed from a butternut squash, you cut it open like you usually would for cooking. You scoop out the seeds. Um, and from there, it's a matter of separating the seeds from the pulp. There's various ways to do that. Um, but for a home gardener, um, you could just pick through, pick through the seeds in the pulp to separate it. You can spread them out on a coarse screen and spray it with a hose. There's different ways to do it. Um, and then you dry it. How about how long would those seeds be viable? I know they'll come up good next year. Would they be good for a couple of years? It depends on the species and the variety, but they're often good for several years, especially if you dry them out really well and keep them in cold storage. You can keep seeds in the freezer and you can keep them in the fridge. The important thing is to have them in an airtight container um, so that moisture doesn't get to them when they're in the fridge or the freezer. Uh, so a, just a regular canning jar works very well. This is Andy Hankins from the ground up. For more information about winter squash and growing organic seed crops, contact your Cooperative Extension Office or the Virginia Association for Biological Farming or Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. We'll see you next time. We're so glad that you could join us to celebrate the bounty that Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are very proud to say this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good month. Chesapeake Bay